Okay, today we're going to look at the supply curve and we're going to begin to look at equilibrium when we put the supply curve and demand curve together. So the stuff we're going to talk about today is in chapter 3, supply and demand, pages 71 to 82. And our goal is to have a better understanding uh, of the determinants of supply, what's going to cause the supply curve to shift either right or left, uh, and we'll begin to look at putting them together. So we'll, we'll begin to look at how do we draw out a supply and demand curve and we'll look at how do you identify equilibrium in a uh, in a market setting. First we talk about a supply it's very much like demand it has a curve it has a schedule to it just like there was a demand schedule uh, we can look at suppliers and say if the price of, of a good was eight dollars I'd supply uh, 22 units of it. If it was seven, I would supply less, or 14. If it was six dollars a unit, I'd supply eight, and so on. So you can begin to see that there is a positive correlation between price and quantity. As price goes up, the quantity supplied will also go up. So as there is a change in price, there is a movement along the supply curve, um, and that movement is generally uh, positively correlated. If there is a change in any other factor, we'll see a shift in the supply curve. And so essentially there is a law of supply by and large. It's not ironclad like the law of demand, but um, there is a general correlation so that when price rises, the quantity supplied will also increase. Um, and that's what gives us an upward sloping supply curve. So demand is downward sloping due to the law of demand which tells us that as price rises, the quantity demanded falls, and the supply curve is upward sloping because as price rises, the quantity supplied will also increase. The curve will shift for any reason related to uh, these five things. So we have a mnemonic for it. The causes of supply are caused by either technology, the price of related goods, input prices, competition, or expectations. And so the mnemonic is TRICE. When we look at technology, we'd say if there, are be if there is better technology, that would reduce the cost of production, um, which means then that uh, as a supplier, you would be willing to produce more goods at the same price, which would cause your supply curve to shift to the right. The price of related goods is also something that might cause the supply curve to shift. It just depends on whether the good is either a substitute or a complement. In the case of a substitute, if the price of, the, of one good goes up, then the supply of the substitute product will go down. For example, um, gasoline versus heating oil. If you're uh, a supplier of gasoline and you see the price of heating oil go up, then uh, presumably you will shift out of gasoline and into heating oil, so your supply of gasoline will go down. And if they are complement, then uh, we tend to see a, a positive correlation. If the price of one goes up, the supply of the other will also uh, go up. So if there are two goods that go together, then the price of one rising will cause supply of the other to go up, like oil and natural gas. Because typically, if you find natural gas, it's also located near oil wells or where oil is located. So if I find uh, natural gas, and the price rises for natural gas, then um, the supply of oil will also go up because it is advantageous for the supplier to produce more oil as they're producing more natural gas. The price of inputs is also uh, a determinant in uh, supply. An input is any sort of uh, good that goes into the production of a good or service. Um, and a change in input prices will have an impact on um, on supply. If the price of an input goes up, if it becomes more expensive to produce the good now than it did before, then the supply uh, will go down. Or what we could say is that um, I, I will be willing to produce the same amount of goods but at a higher price. And so that's a what we would say is a left shift in the supply curve. So in this case, supply would decrease with a rise in prices for inputs. Where I was happy producing uh, this much quantity at this price, I'm going to, uh, yeah. I was going to produce this much at this price, and now because it's more expensive, 
in order to get me to produce the same amount of quantity right down here, I'm going to need a higher price, which means that the supply curve has shifted to the left. If the input prices went down, uh, then we would see an increase in supply, and the supply curve would shift to the right. Competition uh, also has an impact on the supply curve. If we add more suppliers, more competitors in the market, we'll begin to see the supply curve shifting to the right, just like we saw with more demanders, the demand curve would also shift uh, to the right. So in this case, if we said there's only one supplier uh, making coffee beans, and that would be Mr. Figueroa, then if we add a next, another producer or supplier of coffee, Bienfo, then we add the two supplies together, essentially the two supply curves together, and that gives us a new market supply curve, which is to the right of where either of the two individuals were um, on their own. Expectations also play a role in um, the supply curve, and it's shifting either to the right or the left. Um, because suppliers can have a choice as to whether or not to produce a good and offer it for sale now uh, or later. And so if you expect there to be a higher demand later, then you would withhold your supply now until uh, the demand increases. And, and uh, if you expect there to be less demand in the future, then you'd be willing to sell your good right now. And so that'll have an impact on what the supply curve is like. And an example would be gasoline, right? So in the summertime, uh, gasoline producers know that more people drive and there's a higher demand for gasoline and so um, suppliers may hold back the supply of gasoline until the summer and uh, and then they're, they'll be willing to, to sell more. Now if they expect there to be um, a shortage of goods then um, or, or less demand in the future then they'll they'll want to sell now and try and take advantage of of the market that exists so the expectations of suppliers about whether or not there'll be more or less demand in the future will dictate whether their supply curve um, is moving to the right or to the left now we can put all of this together the supply uh, schedule and the demand schedule and create a um, supply and demand graph that shows us the equilibrium price and quantity of a particular good so if we took a demand schedule and a supply schedule for soda, um, we could look at it and we could say that at price of $5 per soda, people demand 50 cans per week. Suppliers are willing to provide 250 cans per week, and that leaves us with a surplus of 200 cans. There are more cans at $5 uh, per can than people want to consume. So if we drop the price to four, we'd find that 100 cans are now demanded. Suppliers are only willing to provide 200 because of the drop in price, and so we only have now 100 extra cans per week um, with that $4 price. If the price is $3 per soda, we find that we are at equilibrium. 150 cans are demanded by consumers. 150 cans are offered by suppliers. There is no shortage, nor is there a surplus. There is just the right amount of cans for the market. And if you were to drop the price to $2, you begin to see that there's now a shortage because at $2, people want more cans, 200, than the suppliers are willing to produce. So we'd have a shortage of 100 cans. And so equilibrium is that point at which the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. Both the, the demanders and the producers have found a point at which there is neither a surplus nor a shortage of any particular good in that market. So in this example, what we could say is the equilibrium price is $3 per can, and the equilibrium quantity is 150 cans. The market clearing price of $3 eliminates both surplus and shortage. Another way of looking at it is that if we had just set the price at $5 and found a surplus of 200 cans, then we could pretty well suspect that some suppliers would be willing to sell their goods for less than $5 in order to try and get extra sales from their competitors. And so by dropping the price to 4 they could squeeze some more sales out of people um, and, and try and steal some sales out of their competitors, and that would begin to reduce the surplus. But because the surplus still exists, they would continue to try and lower their price uh, to get more sales in order to clear that surplus, and we end up at the market clearing price of $3. Conversely, if it were a dollar per can, people would begin to find a shortage, and they might be willing to pay extra to get one of those uh, 
limited number of cans of soda and so maybe a consumer would offer the seller two dollars for a can in order to get one of them and um, and sort of jump the line of other consumers and so we could begin to see um, in a shortage situation where demanders would begin to bid the price up against each other until we got to that three dollar price where there would be no more surplus and no more shortage the market would be cleared everyone would be happy and we would be at what's known as equilibrium and if we were to draw out a graph of this market, we would put price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal, and we could have graphed out demand and supply, and where those two intersect is our market clearing price um, and quantity at $3 per can and 150 cans uh, of soda per week. And so we're going to begin moving forward to looking at not only the supply and why it shifts, we're going to begin looking at equilibrium, and we'll continue to work in this model over the next couple of days. See you in class.